Hello and welcome to Chapter 16, Marine and Coastal Systems and Resources. So basically, by the end of this video, you're going to want to have a good understanding of the ocean as a whole. So ecosystems, current patterns, and even pollution concerns and overfishing. Okay, so just something to keep in mind when thinking about oceans is the pure magnitude of them. So oceans cover 71% of Earth's total surface and contain 97.5% of all of Earth's water. So we think we have a lot of fresh water in our rivers and our reservoirs and everything. Compared to the ocean, we don't because that's really almost 98% of the entire uh, Earth's water. Okay, on that note, let's take a look at topography and salt. So basically, uh, topography is the shape and arrangement of underwa underwater landforms. So in this sense, we can look at this. And so it's basically like the mapping. So you can use that to map out what the ocean floor looks like. So there are a couple main things on this diagram that we're going to point out. Uh, the first of which is a continental shelf, shelf, excuse me, which is this area right here. So say there's a land mass here, that uh, shallow area near the, uh, the actual land mass itself is the continental shelf. It's nice and shallow. Here where it drops off is called the shelf slope break. And then it's the continental slope and then the continental rise. Now let's take a look at salt and why the ocean is salty. So basically the process is rivers carry sediment into the ocean. And from that, evaporation of the ocean surface occurs and removes, and removes pure water, making uh, salt concentrations higher. So that's basically just the general gist of how there is uh, high salt concentrations in the ocean. All right, now let's take a look at ocean structure and currents. So as just a general rule of thumb, the deeper you go in the ocean, the darker and colder it'll get. So there are going to be less effects from wind and sunlight, etc. Moreover, even though that you would think that uh, ocean waters would vary in temperature uh, based on sunlight uh, on a certain day or wind patterns on a certain day, really that's not true. Ocean waters stay pretty stable uh, temperature-wise. Okay, so now let's uh, take a look at currents. So currents flow only within the top 400 meters of water. And so now uh, looking more deeply at currents, there's a very, very important term known as upwelling, which you're going to have to very well understand for environmental science. Basically what upwelling is, is it's the upward flow of cold, deep water, rich in nutrients from the bottom of the ocean. So there are a couple reasons why upwelling is good. Basically what happens when this cold, deep water from the bottom of the ocean moves up to the surface, uh, fisheries love this and it boosts fish productivity because it brings a ton of nutrients with it. So because all these nutrients come up, the fish are more productive, thus the fishermen like it because the fish are in better shape, they can get more fish, the fish are healthier, it's good for everyone. However, uh, something known as the El Nino effect, which we're going to talk about in a second, makes this stop. And uh, because of these unpredictable climate change weather patterns, uh, it's hard to tell if upwelling is going to continue a certain year or not work, and this uh, puts a little strain on fisheries. Okay, uh, so now let's take a look at the disturbance in thermohaline circulation. So basically what that is, is that it's uh, the normal ocean flow. So think like warm water moves along the surface, cold, salty, dense water below the surface. However, this could be uh, disturbed, as I pointed out just now, by the melting of, uh, say, the Greenland ice caps. So because of global warming and the entire Earth heating up, those ice caps could melt. And when that happens, that could just throw off the entire process with all of this new water coming in uh, and just moving all the currents around. So it's really hard to tell what's going to happen, but we know that it's not good if those ice caps melt. Okay, so that carries us into the El Nino and La Nina effects. First, let's start off with the definition of the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Basically, what that is, is a systematic shift in atmospheric pressure, sea surface temperature, and ocean circulation in the tropical Pacific Ocean. More specifically, let's take a look at the El Nino conditions. Basically, the conditions are triggered when air pressure decreases in the equatorial eastern Pacific and increases in the western Pacific, weakening winds and allowing the warm water to flow eastward. Basically, what this does is it causes economic damage as well as environmental damage because as the uh, natural world is uh, inherently hurt by these uh, erratic conditions, all the economic things uh, that uh, are connected to ocean systems and fishing and everything are thrown off. So it's not only bad for the environment, but it's bad for the economy. Now, La Nina conditions are basically the exact opposite of El Nino, but they still have negative effects because they are uh, erratic. 
So the question is, uh, is global warming the main cause of the severity and the frequency of these uh, El Nino and La Nina effects? Because they seem to be happening more and more often. And uh, I'm inclined personally to say yes, because of the erratic patterns that uh, we know that climate change and global warming can cause. And uh, many scientists would agree with me there. However, it's still up in the air and it's kind of hard to determine. Okay, so this brings us into uh, biodiverse marine ecosystems. So as we all know, there are many different types of ecosystems that exist within the oceans. Uh, so let's just run through a couple of the main ones quickly here. Let's start with the open ocean. Basically, the open ocean is full of life. However, uh, famously, the open ocean is full of those creepy, dark-dwelling animals such as the anglerfish here that was featured in Finding Nemo. Very, very scary. Uh, however, the open ocean is more than just, obviously, the anglerfish, but you get the idea. Uh, next, we have kelp forests, which uh, house our favorite keystone species, the sea otter, and uh, much more life. Uh, then we have coral reefs, which we've talked about many, many times in videos before. They're beautiful ecosystems of biodiversity. However, human activity is putting them in a jeopardy. Then we have tidal zones, which just think about as tide pools, salt marshes, mangroves, and estuaries. And an estuary, just to clarify, is where salt water and fresh water meet. That's that ecosystem. Okay, so now let's take a look at marine pollution. Everyone knows that you shouldn't pollute, period, whether it be air pollution or water pollution, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't occur. We've all seen the images of our friend the sea turtle here choking on plastic, or our friend the sea otter with the six-pack container around its neck choking. It's a really quick, easy fix. You just don't throw trash in the ocean, and this doesn't occur. Now let's take a quick look at oil spills, something we're all familiar with as well, and we can focus on the recent BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. So basically, oil spills are uh, a very multi-layered effect. It doesn't just hurt the ecosystems themselves, but it destroys economies, as we know from this BP oil spill in the Gulf. Basically, any uh, business based out of uh, tourism or fishing or anything like that is going to be completely destroyed by an oil spill. So uh, I'm sure you've all heard the stories of the fishermen who can't fish anymore in the Gulf of Mexico and their livelihoods are destroyed or even tourism around the Gulf of Mexico is slowly picking back up. But really, who wants to visit uh, a once beautiful beach that is now covered in oil? No one does. Uh, oil spills are terrible, and they should be avoided at all costs. Okay, uh, let's take a look at overfishing. So overfishing is, uh, as we know, the greatest tragedy of the commons that we've uh, looked at so far. Overfishing the ocean completely depletes a common resource, fish. Uh, so basically, we can look at three types of uh, new industrial fishing uh, methods that are all uh, pretty bad. So uh, first here we have long lining, then we have drag netting, and then we have bottom trawling. And so as you can imagine, you have just these giant hooks or these giant nets just pulling all these fish and random parts of sea life into this net and onto a boat. So as you can imagine, you'd catch some things that you weren't intending to catch, and that's a term known as bycatch. And so that's terrible because, say, you could catch a dolphin when you're fishing for salmon. That dolphin dies for no reason. There's no point in it. You're just catching all these unnecessary species and killing them. However, uh, something to focus on uh, when looking at overfishing is uh, our personal buying power as the consumer. If uh, a group of consumers, say, stopped buying a certain type of fish that uh, was depleting and they knew was getting hurt from overfishing, if everyone pledged to stop eating that fish, the problem could be solved. So it's something to keep in mind that in this case, you actually have some power within yourself as a consumer. Okay, so after speaking about all these disasters, uh, this leads us into the marine conservation area. So there are things known as marine protected areas, and basically that is what it sounds like. Uh, these are areas of ocean that are protected. There are hundreds of them now. It's terrific. Uh, you can't deplete the ecosystems. Everything stays intact and is preserved. Uh, in the same sense, there are things known as marine reserves, which are basically uh, no-take zones. And so you can't take fish out, you can't hurt the ecosystem. Uh, these are in all shapes and sizes now in all parts of the ocean. These are also really great. Uh, so marine conservation is headed in the right direction, and uh, it should help to keep our ocean uh, clean and safe. Okay, uh, conclusion. So ocean and marine ecosystems are very valuable, as we all know. Thus, we must find a way to preserve them so that future generations can enjoy them just the same. Okay, in chapter 17, we're going to take a look at atmospheric science and air pollution. Thank you and see you next time.